Dipin, please send again one link to the ma'am. Ma'am, not able to join. Dipin. Huh? Uh, hello. Uh, madam, ko the uh, first link bejo na. Wo link shayad uh, nahi mil raha hai madam ko. Uh, ek kam karo na. Uh, jo uh, common link hai na, wo de do na madam ko lo usse join karne ko. Fir main unko yes, manually yes. panel isme add kar deta hu. Chalega, chalega, chalega. Okay, okay. डिपेंड डॉक्टर तेजस भंडारी है ना उसमें उनको शिफ्ट करो ना पैनलिस्ट में ओके ओके तेजस भंडारी मैडम का नहीं दिख रहा है शायद वो अब तक जो हेलो तेजस दीपेन इंद्रायणी हेमंत कुमार जो है ना नाम उनको लियो पैनलिस्ट में ओके 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 यस 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 You can unmute yourself, Tejas. Now, even video uh, also unmute. Is my audio clear? Yes. Hi. Yes, ma'am. Also coming on platform. Same issue with ma'am. Also uh, link related. Sorry for uh, delay uh, to all our viewers. This one is case meet forty two. We will see on uh, Friday <laughs> case. Uh, कार्डियक पेशेंट इन नॉन कार्डियक सर्जरी तो टुडे डॉक्टर तेजस बंडारी ही इज प्रैक्टिसिंग एज अ कार्डियक एनेस्थेटिस्ट इन नांदेड ही विल इंट्रोड्यूस टू मैडम्स वी बायोडाटा एंड माय माय सेल्फ इज डॉक्टर सचिन चांदोळकर सेक्रेटरी आईएसए नांदेड वी आर कंडक्टिंग दिस थिंग सिंस आवर प्लैटिनम जुबली सेलिब्रेशन ईयर सो दिस वन इज 42 वी विल प्लानिंग टू कंप्लीट दिस 75th case me still then uh, and this one is on overall uh, we are uh, doing on private uh, practice forum point of view case meets so and this one will be uploaded on our icsa youtube channel uh, that is icsa city branch nanded ma'am you are on now uh, okay uh, yes. uh, are you able to share na just yes share. i will be able to share i'm sure i yes. should not have a problem yes Uh, good evening everybody uh, to start with i would like to thank uh, dr sachin chandolkar and dr prahlad katkar uh, Ko uh, kotkar for kotkar yes. yes kotkar for inviting me uh, for this webinar on this very important topic uh, if you see today even ma'am uh, previously uh, should i introduce yourself through dr tejas bandari then you start with your uh, okay sir. yes So, Tejas, please. Yeah. Good evening, everybody. It's a great opportunity. Thank you, Chandrakar sir and Kotkar sir, for uh, asking me to introduce uh, the legend of uh, anesthesia. 
one of the legend of anesthesia uh, uh she is dr indrani himant kumar madam uh, she has a vast experience of 31 years she is a hod and professor of anesthesia in km uh, mumbai she is a, a first rank holder in uh, her post graduation in da and md anesthesia in mumbai university she is a f- uh, fellow in uh, cardiac anesthesia from uh, lehi valley uh, hospital in pennsylvania pennsylvania she has uh, 42 publications under her name uh, she is also member of special board of anesthesia in nbems new delhi also a special uh, specialist board member for bls and acls uh, modules in mhs she is a governing council member of ms uh, cisa for two terms she is a past governing council member for association of medical consultants mumbai she is a organized uh, she has organized master class every year for residents all over india and we were uh, one of the uh, residents when madam had uh, in, uh, organized such class uh she is also organized innumerable workshops of and cmes she is a, a trained she has trained in simulation and conducted simulation workshops she is examiner for mhs and universities in other states also uh, her main uh, interest is in obstetric pediatric cardiac anesthesia and critical care she uh, she was president uh, rs acp national and past president in isc mumbai she was also so president uh, she was member in isa national task force for covid uh, national uh, also isa task force committee for cpr she was member of uh, transplant committee for km hospital she was also a member of uh, critical care committee of km hospital for plight, uh, for fighting against covid uh, she is organizing uh, she was organizing chamber for isacon in 2000 uh, chairman uh, in uh, 2011 for isacon she has received uh, bharat jyoti award and nitya kalamani award and uh, thank you ma'am uh, to share your views today so, uh, thank you and uh, i invite you in, on behalf of uh, our president dr kotkar and uh, secretary uh, dr chandur ka sir and isa nanded she will be discussing on anesthesia concentration in patient with coronary artery disease for major co- non cardiac surgeries a very important and very uh, vast topic thank you madam thank you tejas uh, thank you dr kotkar uh, president isa nanded and sachin thank sachin you. was my student and i am really happy to be part of this uh, webinar so let me just start sharing start with uh, yes. sharing my presentation All right visible let me go yes on. clearly let's start the slide show it will be work now yeah visible now yes ma'am yes it's visible all right so so uh friends uh the topic for today is anesthetic management of an ischemic heart disease patient presenting for non cardiac surgery so you know that in modern times with the with the type of you know life we have patients of 20s and 30s are coming for you know uh, percutaneous uh, you know uh, interventions uh, coronary interventions and for cabgs so if that is the case the kind of patients who will be presenting with ischemic heart disease for non cardiac surgery is only going to increase so how are we going to manage so what is the problem basically because of ischemic heart disease i'm not able to run the slide one minute let me just uh, check uh i think my slide just stopped one minute let me check i'm just trying to share again the whole thing just uh... 
Sachin, are you able to hear me now? Yes, ma'am. You are clearly okay, visible. Okay, I'm just trying to share also. the screen all over again. Yes, yes, yes. No issues. Just visible now. Yeah, okay. I'll just, I'll get it to slideshow. The whole thing just, uh, okay. All right. You must be wondering why. Because patients with ischemic heart disease undergoing non-cardiac surgery they are at increased risk for perioperative cardiovascular events like myocardial infarction, heart failure, or even death. So when you look at a patient of ischemic heart disease in the preoperative period, how do you approach that patient? First is you have to evaluate the current medical status, and then you have to evaluate the risk. Second is to know the risk benefit equation. So I'll come to the risk benefit equation as I come further down, because you'll have to tell whether this patient, does this patient require revascularization before the non-cardiac surgery or not? So what is the risk if the patient does not undergo any coronary intervention? Or what is the risk if the patient undergoes coronary in intervention? And then comes for non-cardiac surgery. And thirdly, an advice regarding revascularization. That also has to be considered in the preoperative period. So coming to risk stratifications. So what are those, uh, those uh, things which increase the risk? One is advanced age, male gender, diabetes, non-invasive tests with high risk results, clinical instability, LV dysfunction, and if the patient has multivessel disease or left main disease. So the risk benefit equation is whether the patient should undergo maximal medical therapy and then come for the non-cardiac surgery or patient should undergo myocardial revascularization before. So an advice regarding revascularization should be done to reduce the fatal and non-fatal cardiovascular events in high-risk patients presenting for intermediate and high-risk procedures. So I will be talking about those things. When an unacceptable level of angina or congestive heart failure related symptoms persist, so these are the patients who will say, I get breathless even if I go to the toilet. So if that, or I get chest pain even if I go to the toilet. So if that kind of unacceptable level of angina or heart failure purposes, then you have to think about revascularization or when the patient experiences troubling side effects from medication. So what is the general approach? So you have to involve the cardiologist or the primary care physician, of course, the anesthesiologist and the surgeon because and a good preoperative evaluation means good outcome. So a proper and a thorough preoperative evaluation is needed in these patients. So how do you stratify the risk in these patients? Get a good history, do a good physical, do tests like ECG, labs. Some of them should have selective stress testing. A 2D echo has to be done. And in patients who cannot walk like ortho patients, you can do a stress echo and clinically indicated catheterization or a CT angio or a perfusion scan. So how do you minimize the risk? Preoperatively, risks can be minimized by giving the patient beta blockers, correcting the anemia on a risk-directed PCI in these patients and clinically indicated CABG if needed. So in the preoperative, period, how the clinical evaluation should be done to identify serious cardiac disorders like presence of heart failure arrhythmias. You have to define the severity, stability, and the prior treatment, presence of comorbid conditions. Again, very, very important you have to evaluate in these patients, presence of diabetes, mellitus. If the patient has peripheral vascular disease, 
be rest assured this patient has coronary artery disease if the patient has renal disease again there is a very bright chance that this patient has coronary artery disease presence of copd all these have to be have to be taken into account when you're doing a pre operative evaluation we will come to know that more the number of comorbidities more will be the risk of surgery in these patients anesthesia and surgery and minimizing the risk that is giving a standard treatment so what we do is have a um, a step wise bayesian strategy where you have a clinical markers to understand the severity of the coronary artery disease prior coronary evaluation and treatment doing a functional capacity testing and surgery specific risk so these four are the pillars of your pre operative testing so the clinical predictors are divided as major predictors intermediate predictors and minor predictors so the major clinical predictors are if the patient has acute or a recent myocardial infarction within one month patient has unstable or severe angina large ischemic burden so these are the patients who have to go for stress test decompensated congestive heart failure or significant arrhythmias at this point of time i'd like to tell you what do you mean by an unstable angina so for just an example that if i walk from my house to uh, say or if i walk from km hospital to tata hospital which is very close by then i get angina after i reach tata hospital that used to be there that i know if i put in that much of effort from km hospital to tata hospital i get angina but now i just come back from from my ot to km gate and i start getting angina now today that is unstable angina so what was stable angina now is now becoming an unstable angina i hope you understood what is unstable angina so what are the intermediate clinical predictors a remote a patient got mi several several years back stable angina compensated cardiac failure so the patient is treated now patient had gone into cardiac failure but now nicely treated creatinine by about 2 and presence of diabetes minor clinical predictors advanced age abnormal ecg rhythm other than sinus history of cva and uncontrolled hypertension so we come to the next one which is the functional capacity so if the patient has poor functional capacity it only means poor cardio respiratory reserve so we all know we ask the patient to uh, how many flights of stairs you climb right so by that we we can make out what is the functional capacity of that patient so here in a patient of ischemic heart disease we need to give so much of emphasis to functional capacity remember all your tests may be looking abnormal or normal or rather normal i would say even if your tests are normal and if the patient is saying no i can't even uh, you know walk uh, a, a say uh, 500 meters then it means it's poor functional capacity which means the patient is extremely high risk even your your tests may all be normal but still it is very very high risk so functional capacity has so much of emphasis in a case of ischemic heart disease and please don't forget to to find out what is the functional capacity of the patient so if so we we weigh the functional capacity by knowing the metabolic equivalent so what is metabolic equivalent a low metabolic equivalent which is less than 4 mets it means patient has very increased uh, increased surgical risk an intermediate mets is between 4 and 10 mets you and me fall into this cat this category of intermediate level of 4 to 10 mets we are able to do our routine work no problem so that's intermediate uh, mets 
and excellent will be more than 10 minutes. These are the ones who are athletes who can really raise their bar and do a lot of things. So those who run marathons, they're all having a high meds, right? So what is low meds? Eating, dressing, walking around the house, dishwashing, all this will constitute low meds. Intermediate meds will be climbing flight of stairs, level walking at four meters per hour, scrubbing the floor, moving heavy furniture or golf. All these are golf. You don't have to run a lot. So that's intermediate meds. Excellent will be swimming, tennis, basketball, any of these uh, at, at our athlete, athletes, all of them, all the athletes will have a high met metabolic equivalent. So further preoperative testing to assess the coronary risk will be to know the surgery specific risk. So this again is important. We now know the patient has ischemic heart disease. We know what is the functional capacity of the patient. We know whether the patient falls under clinical markers when you look at the clinical markers, whether they are minor, intermediate, or high risk, but now we are looking into the surgery specific risk. Surgery specific risk basically because of the hemodynamic stress and the surgical duration. So, what are the surgery specific risks in these patients? The surgery will be considered a high risk with more than 5% mortality if it is an emergency surgery, aortic or other major vascular surgery, a peripheral vascular surgery, or a prolonged surgery uh, with large fluid, left, fluid shifts, right? So intermediate risk will be the patient's risk of death will be less than five. death or presence of myocardial events, cardiovascular occurrence of cardiovascular events is less than 5%, like in carotid and arterectomy, endovascular AA and aortic, uh, uh, aortic artery aneurysm repair, head and neck surgeries, intraperitoneal and intrathoracic surgeries, orthopedic and prostate surgeries. And low risk procedures are peripheral procedures, cataract, uh, breast uh, surgery, again, peripheral procedure, endoscopic procedures, all of them are considered as low risk surgeries. The risk stratification was proposed by a lot of people. Goldman proposed, Detsky proposed, Eagle proposed, ASA proposed. There are plenty of Canadian uh, stratification is also there. But what's important for us is Goldman criteria, where he and, and the uh, Lee's criteria. So here, Goldman criteria, he took into consideration certain comorbid uh, conditions like the presence of recent MI for less than six months, unstable angina, heart failure, abdominal or thoracic surgery, severe aortic stenosis, emergent surgery, age more than 70, rhythm other than sinus, presence of S3 gallop, and other metabol um, medical or metabolic problems. So, if and he gave a certain uh, a certain point to each of them, and then he calculated what is the total point. And then he gave the risk. So the points he gave was if the patient had MI within last six months, it's 10. More than, uh, more than six months, it's five. Then, uh, then unstable angina, 10. If the patient had class four angina, it's 20. Pulmonary edema within one week, 10. For, uh, and then uh, critical aortic stenosis, 20. So like that, he gave so many points. And if the patient had more than 30 points, then the patient is extremely high risk. 20 to 30 intermediate risk, zero to 15 low risk. Then we, we came to RCRI, which was presented by Lee. And this was the one which, which, which took the entire anesthesia uh, fraternity to look into what Lee said, because he came with proper evidence. And this was published in the circulation in 1999. And he took independent predictors like presence of high risk surgery, history of ischemic heart disease, history of congestive heart failure, history of CVA, 
diabetes requiring insulin and presence of creatinine more than 2 mg per deciliter. And he said, he identified if the patient has only one risk or two out of these six, three out of the six or four out of six, what will be the prediction of post perioperative myocardial events or even death. So what he did was he, uh, if the patient had only one risk, okay, so the mortality was less than 1%. If the patient had, ha, sorry, zero risk, it is less than 1%. If the patient had one risk, then other vascular there is, and uh, surgeries, there is much, not much, but with aortic aneurysm, the risk becomes almost 7 to 8%. If the patient had two of, two of those risks, which I just said, look at the way, look at the, look at the uh, steep rise in the uh, incidence of morbidity and mortality. And finally, presence of more than two, yes, it's sky high, sky high, uh, uh, you know, risk of pre uh, presence of post-operative cardiac events or even surgery. So if there was no risk factors, it is about 0.5% uh, risk of death. So when so here he looked into rate of cardiac death, non-fatal myocardial infarction, non-fatal cardiac arrest according to the number of predictors. So if it was no risk, it is 0.5%. One risk is 1%, two risk is 2.5%. If three, it is more than that, double. So if you have three or more risk, it is almost like double the amount of uh, risk for the patient. And rate of presence of myocardial infarction in the perioperative period, or with the patient, the rate in if the patient can develop pulmonary edema, VF, or a primary cardiac arrest or complete heart block. That for that again, he took the risk factors. If there was no risk, 0.5 percent. One risk is 1.3. Two risk is 3.6. And three or more risk is almost like 10 percent. Three times the two, uh, pa a patient having only two risks. So in the preoperative period, if the patient needs coronary vascularization, again, the question arises whether the patient needs a PCI or whether the patients need CABG. So what decides the, the cardiologist will be the main person who will be deciding on this. Again, you also have to see depending upon whether this, what is the nature of surgery, what anesthesia you're going to give, what could be the possible complications, how high is the hemorrhagic risk, and what are the other individual hemor hemorrhagic risk factors, what are the consequences of excessive bleeding, what is the urgency, can it be delay delayed, what are the alternatives to surgical treatment. All these questions have to be answered before you take up these patients for any non-cardiac surgery. So once, according to the ACC, American Heart Association guidelines, so the risk stratification will start by asking the question, is the surgery urgent, emergent? Yes. If the surgery is emergent, no need of anything, take the patient to the OR because here is a patient who needs emergency surgery. Is it Emergent means just now you have to take the patient. Is it urgent or it is it elective? Then you look at the patient, whether the patient already had revascularization in the last five years. Yes, if the patient had revascularization and is not having any symptom, straight away take the patient to the OR. But if the patient has symptoms now following revascularization, then this is a patient who needs further risk stratification. Also, if the patient did not have any revascularization at all, you need to do further risk stratification. So look at the clinical predictors. <coughs> Does the patient come under major, intermediate or minor clinical predictor, uh, the clinical predictors? If the patient comes under the category of major, you, do you have to postpone the surgery? You have to postpone the surgery and do a coronary angiography. 
or the patient will need extensive medical treatment and risk factor optimization. If the patient comes under intermediate uh, category, look at the functional capacity. Is the patient not able to do anything at all? Is the patient having less than four meds? Is the patient not moving around inside the house? So then you have to do, a, you look for uh, further testing of these patients. So then you have to go for uh, stress testing or stress echo or uh, my perfusion scanning and things like that. So you'll have to do further testing on these patients. And if the patient is able, is the metabolic equivalent is more than four, and if the surgical procedural risk is high, again, you have to go for the same stress testing. But if it is intermediate or low, you can straight away take the patient to the OR. Because here is a patient whose uh, clinical predict uh, prediction is intermediate and the surgical prediction is also intermediate or low. So here you can take the patient to the OR. If the clinical predictors is minor in these patient, then if the metabolic equivalent is low, then you look at the surgical procedural risk. If it is intermediate or low, you can take the patient to the OR. And if it is more than four minutes, again, a patient can go to the OR. So uh, if the, if the uh, obviously, if the, if the functional capacity is less than four, you need further testing. So this uh, slide gives you in one look on one side, you have the medical risk on this side and surgery specific risk on this side. So if you, those patients whose medical risk is major and surgical risk is low, intermediate or high, sorry, low, intermediate or high are high risks. Those who have medical risks of, of minor and intermediate, they are in the green, so which means they can go to the OR. Those who are in yellow and red and orange will need further testing. So which test to choose? If the patient is an ambulatory patient, you can go for a treadmill stress test or an ambulate and an ambulatory ECG. If the patient is having abnormal resting ECG, okay, then the patient will need echo or thallium. Patient is unable to exercise, patient will have to go for a DSC, adenosine thallium and a dipyridamol thallium scan or a CT angio or a coronary angio depending upon what the patient, uh, that the, uh, the cardiologist will decide. How to monitor for ischemia? So according to the symptom, patient will complain of, usually many times patient may not complain, otherwise patient will save chest pain, uh, then uh, symptoms of breathlessness, sweating, nausea, vomiting, altered mentation, clinical signs, uh, heart rate changes, arrhythmias. Patient will say, "I'm getting, you know, I'm, I'm, I feel, I, my heart rate is raising. You know, I'm missing some beats." So all these are presence of hypotension. Patients' BP is only around 100, 110, 105. So persistent hypotension. In all this, ECG is a key intraoperative monitor. PA catheters, we don't use them nowadays. TEE is excellent, but again, only in uh, tertiary care uh, centers, you can have all these. Again, when you look at the ECG, the patients can have depression or ST elevation. Depression is if the patient has subendocardial ischemia, then the ECG will be of small uh, voltage, okay? So, and there will be poor localization. There will be a down sloping here from the J point. Yeah, the J point is down and it is from the, the ST wave will start from the J point. So if there is an up sloping, uh, then in ST elevation, you find that there is an up sloping of the T wave. So all so elevation generally means it's uh, it's a uh, it's a very severe myocardial infarction. J point ST depression will signif will will talk will signify that here is a patient who has 
myocardial ischemia. Whereas those with an elevation, it means the patient is having myocardial infarction now. So let us look at the anesthetic management. Most ischemic episodes, especially in a patient with a known coronary artery disease on the GA, is silent and it may be missed. A number of silent, uh, repeated and prolonged episodes of ischemia may occur during intubation or extubation uh, proven by demonstrating acidosis in the coronary system. And patients with hypertension or CCF, it is possible that they can have episodes of subendocardial ischemia during the surgery in these patients. Why surgery is a stress? Surgery can, surgical trauma, anesthesia, analgesia, intubation, extubation, pain, hypothermia, bleeding, anemia, fasting, all of them can trigger an inflammatory state, a hypercoagulable state, a stress kind of situation, and a hypoxic state. So with inflammatory state, you will find that a plaque which was stable will start fissuring. A hypercoagulable state is dangerous because these are the patients who can develop acute coronary thrombus. And a stress state is because there is increase in catecholamines and cortisol levels. There will be a sheer stress in the coronary arteries and you can have fissuring of the plaque. And hypoxic state, there will be less oxygen delivery. Patient's BP will go up, heart rate will go up, free fatty acids will go up, and there will be increase in relative insulin deficiency. All of them can lead to an increase in oxygen demand. That leads to perioperative myocardial infarction. So the prominent factors in the intraoperative period, which one should avoid, is hypertension, Relative hypotension, that is any blood pressure less than 80 millimeter mercury should be immediately treated. <coughs> Tachycardia, bradycardia and the anesthesia duration. <coughs> so preoperatively, hypertension should be under control. Continuation of preoperative antihypertensive treatment is very critical. Consider the urgency of surgery and the potential benefit of more intensive medical therapy in these patients. And a myocardial heart disease, presence of dilated and hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, they are associated with increased incidence of STT changes and perioperative heart failure. So the preoperative controls, we can just talk in terms of A, B, C, D, E, uh, whether uh, give the patient aspirin, give the patient antianginals, alpha-2 agonists, all of them should continue. B is beta blocker and blood pressure. Control the blood pressure, continue beta blockers. C is cigarette smoking and cholesterol and clopidogrel. Uh, stop cigarette smoking, cholesterol control using statins and clopidogrel has to be stopped at least a week before. Fourth is diet and diabetes. Have a control on your diet and control on your diabetes, education and exercise. So these are the preoperative controls. So what is the risk reduction strategies in the intraoperative period? One is to ensure that you monitor properly. So here is a patient with ischemic heart disease. You have to step up your monitor. Apart from your ECG, NIBP, temperature, ETCO2, SPO2, urine output, uh, you have to monitor the dynamic indices in these patients. So stroke volume variation, you will, need, you will see that the pulse oximeter plat, uh, graph is going up and down with respiration. We know here is a patient whose volume is less, hypovolemic. So you look at the dynamic indices in these patients. Not all of them will need an arterial line or a CVP. Those patients who are high risk clinically and coming for high risk surgeries, they are the ones who will need arterial line or a PA uh, sorry, uh, or a CVP, not a PA diet. So what are the emergency CVC, CVS drugs you will keep with you when you're dealing with a patient of severe, uh, a patient of ischemia? So even in your uh, private practice, ensure all these are in your basket. Ephedrine, phenyl, no, you don't have to open them and keep it, but you have to at least have them with you. 
एफेड्रेन फिनाइल एफ्रेन आई वी बीटा ब्लॉक एन टी जी डोकोमेन डोबेट सो वॉट आर द गोल्स गोल्स आई एम कॉलिंग इट अ क्रैप नो इट्स नॉट अ क्रैप जस्ट दैट अमोनिक सी फॉर कंट्रेक्टिलिटी सो यू ensure that the patient is contractility contractility is good rate keep a low rate keep a normal sinus rhythm maintain a low afterload and maintain an adequate period so these are the goals of these patients i just said the whole thing so the intraoperative goals as i said is to look into the fav favorable part of the coronary demand and supply ratio so this is one is to increase the myocardial oxygen supply and to reduce the oxygen myocardial oxygen demand so how are you going to increase the myocardial oxygen supply by maintaining a low normal heart rate by maintaining proper hemoglobin high normal aortic pressure that is maintaining the blood pressure reduced coronary vascular resistance and low left ventricular end diastolic pressure and by it decreasing the demand by keep again maintaining a proper heart rate low myocardial wall tension or a half to load and avoiding increasing increased myocardial contractility that is blood pressure so this is the two sides of the equation that is the oxygen and the uh, oxygen supply and the oxygen demand so on the oxygen uh, supply we have good coronary uh, myocardial oxygen supply by maintaining a uh, hemoglobin as i said maintaining a good coronary blood flow by maintaining a good diastolic blood pressure lv edp uh, patent coronary artery and coronary vascular tone and by taking care of the demand by reducing the wall tension and increasing the contract the contractility and reducing the heart rate so these are the two sides of the equation that one has to take care of i already to spoke about this so on the morning of surgery patient has to be properly premedicated you need to give a narcotic sedative premedication fentanyl 2 to 4 microgram per kilogram or morphine 0.1 to 0.2 mg per kilogram along with midazolam 0.2 to 0.3 mg per kilogram can be given antianginals keep keep a patch or a spray ready with you beta blockers and calcium channel blockers have to be continued alpha 2 agonists if the patient is on chloridine fine otherwise you yourself can start dexmedetomidine in this patient as the, as you take the patient into the theater perioperative beta blockers have shown to reduce the incidence of morbidity and mortality and most of the patients of ischemic heart disease will come with beta blockers so what about patients with a coronary stent and non cardiac coming for non cardiac surgery so these are the patients you have to discontinue dual antiplatelet medication because endothelialization can take up to one or two years so no test is there to prove complete endothelialization till today the risk of bleeding and thrombus with surgery is very high and you have to wait for at least one year for the elective surgery after a stent so if the patient has ischemic a patient has come with a stent what is the assessment you'll have to do ask the patient what is the kind of stent is it a bare metallic stent which is generally not there here nowadays patient will come with a drug eluting stent or a bioresorbable scaffold system a des patient you have to wait for at least one year bioresorbable scaffold system if the patient has received you have to wait for at least 4 to 6 months and how many stents is it single or a multiple stent which coronary space stent left main led rca so complex what is the position and placement is it proximal is it a distal or is it at bifurcation what is the timing of in, uh, insertion i have already told you about this all these questions have to be asked again revascularization is it complete or are there residual blocks so what happens is many of the cardiologists will look only into the culprit vessels 
and they will stent only one vessel. There will be 50% block in the other vessel, 40% block in the other vessel. So find out whether the revascularization was complete and is the patient on antiplatelet treatment, is the patient on treat, uh, aspirin, clopidogrel, dipyridamol, low molecular weight heparin or UFH. So what is the duration of a therapy? Has it been started recently? If the patient has been for a very long time, remember there is something called clopidogrel resistance. So these are the patients who will thrombose and develop MI in front of you. And aspirin also, for a very long time, if the patient is taking, patient can have aspirin resistance. So if the patient is on low molecular weight, you know when to stop, you can advise when to stop. If the patient is on UFH, you can again advise when to stop. Low molecular weight, heparin, if the patient is on therapeutic low molecular weight heparin, you have to wait for 24 hours. So, and if it is UFH, you have to wait for at least six hours. So cessation of therapy, aspirin is never stopped. Clopidogrel is stopped. Uh, if the patient is having uh, at least, uh, if the patient is having bare metallic stent, for one month, you cannot take up the patient. And if the patient is having drug eluting stent, not at least for three to six months. So these are the patients who will receive clopidogrel continuously. Now, what are the, what are the increase in bleeding risk? So if there is an increase in bleeding risk, you have to stop clopidogrel seven days before. And if the patient is on ticlopidin, ticlopidin at least 14 days before. And if the risk is small, dual antiplatelet therapy can be continued. So here I'm talking of the surgical bleeding risk. If the risk is small, you continue dual antiplatelet therapy. And then aspirin is continued in both elective and emergency surgeries. And if there is time, you please convert the patient to UFH or low molecular weight heparin if there is time. And look at the proposed strategy. The proposed strategy is to stop clopidogrel at least five to seven days before the non-cardiac surgery, admit the patient three days before, and stop. And you can start a tirofibeman or a UFH infusion. Stop the infusion six hours before surgery and go ahead with the surgery and restart clopidogrel on the first post-operative day. And uh, elective uh, patients. Uh, stop clopidogrel seven days prior to surgery. Uh, and if it is if it is an emergency uh, surgery, you may have to give platelet transfusion. Or, and remember, all of them will need mandatory platelet function testing. And if the patient is coming for, and if the patient already has an epidural, remove epidural catheter uh, after, uh, after the transfusion of platelets, reinstate dual therapy early to avoid the stent thrombosis, and similar caution with CVP and A lines have to be taken. Uh, if the patient uh, has come for an emergency uh, with antiplatelet therapy, uh, then the dual, uh, if the patient is having hemorrhagic risk surgery, platelet transfusion has to be continued. If the neuroxial block is necessary, mandatory platelet function testing has to be done and platelet, platelet transfusion has to be given. TEG is a very good guide. So in all these patients, how much of platelet count is acceptable? A common invasive procedure where you can uh, compress the hematoma, 50,000 is good enough. Neurosurgery should be more than 1 lakh. Ophthal surgery, more than 1 lakh. Axial uh, regional anesthesia, up to 50,000 is okay. Spinal anesthesia, 50 to 80,000. Epidural has to be more than 80,000 to 1 lakh. So the technique of anesthesia which has to be followed in these patients is if you're looking at general anesthesia, no single anesthetic agent is the best agent for ischemic heart disease, mind you. So all of them uh, amongst the evils, etomidate is better because of better hemodynamic stability. Amongst opioids, High opioid anesthesia is always good because it maintains cardiovascular stability, and but but then the problem is post-operative ventilation, and of course the need for anesth anesthetic agents is much less if you're giving a high opioid anesthesia. 
Inhalational agents, most of them are known to cause myocardial depression. Some of them are known to cause even coronary steel. And neuraxial blocks are excellent, especially peripheral nerve blocks are excellent. And if you're giving neuraxial block as in spinal, remember, if you maintain a low level, minimum sympathetic blockade will be there and minimum hemodynamic change. But remember, if there is any hypotension, you have to quickly treat the hypotension with phenylephrine. So the anesthetic technique is to maintain the oxygen demand supply and to avoid ischemia. So your choice can be both general or regional or a combination of both. As I said, short acting agents with least cardiovascular effects are preferred. For example, midazolam is preferred for pre-medication. Fentanyl is preferred as an opiate. Etomidate is preferred as an induction agent. Remifentanyl is going to come into the market in India. And if we have remifentanyl, that's going to really make a big difference in these patients who are presenting for non-cardiac surgery. Sevoflurane and desflurane is very good. Isoflurane is known to cause coronary steel. Vicuronium and rocuronium, any of them can be used. So the general anesthesia technique is maintaining, as I said, the demand supply, uh, giving good pre-medication, proper induction, attenuation of laryngoscopy and intubation by whatever method you know, and maintaining a good anesthetic depth in these patients and preventing pain. So the maintain hemodynamics, strictly avoid hypotension or hypertension, avoid tachycardia, ensure good pain relief because in pain, if there's tachycardia, the most most probable reason is because of pain relief, uh, because of pain. Avoid hypothermia. Again, I would like to stress this. Many of us don't take this so seriously, but remember if the patient develops hypothermia, the incidence of myocardial infarction has gone up exponentially. Avoid hypovolemia or even hypervolemia. So regional anesthetic technique, you can use spinal epidural, or a combination of both central as well as peripheral blockade, all are welcome in a case of ischemic heart disease, provided they come under the the uh, any of these categories, even a high risk category, peripheral nerve blockade is excellent in these patients. But when it comes to central neuraxial blockade, you have to be very, very sure that the patient doesn't have a very high level and that patient does not develop to hypotension in these cases. So a Cochrane uh, library, this was the publication. It's a review of nine systemic review of RCT. It summarized the outcomes of neuraxial analgesia with or without GA versus GA alone in a patient. And what did they come out with? They said that neuraxial blockade alone reduces a zero to 30 day mortality and decreases the risk of pneumonia in these patients, which means they are, they are saying, go ahead with your neuraxial blockade. Right, you did everything you can. And suddenly you find the STT is starting sagging in your patient. What do you do? So the management overview is all this while, the ECG was normal. Now suddenly the STT has started sagging. So remember, interventions are often implemented at the same time. So you have to establish a temporal relationship because the sudden STT change will not happen suddenly. Some thing has happened before. That is why the STTs are now changed. What preceded this development? That question has to come. So. You assess the urgency of the situation, inform the surgeon, step up your monitoring. Now you start taking an essential line. Now, if the patient is, is on a block, whether it is a central or a, or a peripheral nerve block, so the patient, you ask the patient, wake up the patient and ask him, do you have chest pain, breathlessness, or you see whether the patient is sweating or if the patient is having nausea, vomit. If any of them are there, remember, you there is that means the patient is indeed having 
severe my getting into myocardial infarction you have to do something and i'll tell you what to do is the patient continuously coughing under the block or patient is trying to wake up patient is restless then that means please auscultate and see whether the patient is having any congestive heart failure is there any altered mentation suddenly the patient was nicely responding and now the patient is not responding or does the patient have heart rate changes a new onset arrhythmia or hypotension did the patient or when you were giving an epidural top up was it a recent top up because you have to think was it an intravascular uh, uh, you know injection or was it a total spinal that has to come in your mind if it was a recent top up was any new drug you know given like for example did you give an antibiotic or did you start a colloid like hemexil or was is it a, a you know a, a cement or was then you'll have to look whether it could be an anaphylaxis any hypovolemia did the patient suddenly bleed too much or if it is a laparoscopic surgery is the patient having too much of hypercarbia or is the patient is having as i said sudden hemorrhage any hypothermia we don't touch the patient in drop we have to touch the patient and see whether the patient is having hypothermia is the breathing oxygenation adequate or is there any drop in his so spo2 all these have to be all these questions have to be answered in such a patient you secure the system so you have to give proper fio2 give adequate oxygenation maintain the blood pressure if the patient has bled you have to give blood optimize the volume and heart rate you might have to give beta blockers in drop uh, as i said uh, you may have to uh, give phenylephrine if the bp is low step up your monitoring as i said inform the surgeon and tell ask him whether there is any alteration in the surgical plan whether you can do something to complete the surgery at the earliest if the patient is in pain consider a top up or if you feel that it uh, your regional has failed you have may have to give general anesthesia on this patient rapid return to normothermia enhance it in make sure that patient is having normothermia make sure that the mandatory hemoglobin should be at least 10 grams percent and for the ischemia a sublingual uh, ntg that is uh, uh, sorbitrate can be given uh, or if you have a patch you apply a patch and if it is emergent with hypotension uh, you may have to start inotropes and you may have to give iv ntg in these patient in these patients and keep increasing the ntg you, as i said you may combine it with a vasopressor consider an acute coronary syndrome in these patients quickly uh, crush some uh, aspirin and can give it to the patient or uh, you may think of even giving heparin in these patients if the surgery permits so which kind of surgery does not permit uh, neurosurgery ophthalmic surgery spine surgery and you know uh, patients who come with prostate prosthetic surgery these are the surgeries which will not permit heparin other surgeries you may think of giving heparin because here is a case of acute coronary syndrome continue beta blockers patient may need iv beta blocker so uh, if the patient is under general anesthesia so here your patient can never participate in your questioning so what was the precipitating cause what happened now that the patient was normal all the while and now the patient is having stt changes so if the patient is having ischemia without any hemodynamic alterations so please see that sympathetic modulation by giving good analgesia beta blockade you can give alpha 2 agonist you can give uh, you know uh, dexmedetomidin ensure there is normothermia just give sublingual nitroglycerin tablet and uh, in these uh, put a uh, nitroglycerin tablet on the patient or an intranasal nitroglycerin or iv nitroglycerin any of them will help because here the hemodynamic alterations have not happened on these patients if the if the patient develops ischemia stt changes accompanied by tachycardia then you have to say what could have been the reason are they non specific stt changes 
Is it because of light anesthesia? Is it because following endotracheal intubation? Is it hypovolemia? Is it fever? Is the patient developing, you know, creps? Uh, is it because of heart failure or is it because of pain? So if there is hypo, uh, if there is ischemia accompanied by tachycardia, please give esmolol about 300 microgram bolus and start an infusion. You can also give atenolol bolus or a petoprolol bolus. If beta blockade is contraindicated, you can give calcium channel blockers as an infusion. Bolus followed by infusion. Start dexmeritomidin in these patients because you have to control the tachycardia by all means, not just with beta blockers, or you, can, or you also have to use dexmeritomidin to control the heart rate. If the ischemia is accompanied by tachycardia and hypertension, so which means we have tilted the whole thing to an excessive myocardial oxygen demand. So look at the oxygenation, ventilation, see if the patient is in CCF, check the, uh, auscultate the chest, verify what the anesthetics, whether it's administered. You may find that there is no volatile agent in your uh, in in the in the in the anesthetic system, you know you the, the whole uh, your des desflurane or sevoflurane might have got exhausted. Uh, selective beta one blocker is the drug of choice, like atenolol or uh, or esmolol. Calcium channel blockers can be given. NTG is added if control is not achieved. Remember, if you're giving beta blockers, you have to expect bronchospasm and heart failure, but selective beta blockers will not give you this problem. If the myocardial ischemia is accompanied by hypervolemia, which means you have infused too much of fluids, which then the problem is an uh, increase in uh, fluid will increase the left ventricular endostatic volume, volume will increase the left ventricular endostatic pressure, increase the wall tension, increase oxygen consumption, and that can lead to myocardial ischemia. So the treatment here will be giving diuretics. If the patient is on regional or a central neuraxial blockade, you give oxygen and intubate this patient. However, if the ischemia is accompanied by tachycardia and hypotension, what you have to do is you have to build up the volume quickly, give crystalloids or colloids, if the patient has been bleeding and that is the cause of hypotension and tachycardia, remember you have to give PRBC transfusion as soon as possible and maintain a transfusion trigger of at least 10, at least hemoglobin of at least 10 grams percent. If infarction is imminent with little time to treat, uh, to treat the cause by time using an alpha agonist by giving phenylephrine. So give phenylephrine and try to bring up the blood pressure in these patients as early as possible. There is something called Prince metal angina or a angina which is caused by vasospasm and that can happen with heavy smokers or in patients where there is transmural ischemia and these are the patients who may develop life-threatening arrhythmia such as ventricular tachycardia or ventricular fibrillation and the treatment of choice in these patients who have vasospasm is calcium channel blockers. So these are, and at the same time, you have to treat them as any other ischemia. So you have to give IV nitrates in these patients. Concurrent intervention with beta blockers may be, should or may, should be given and anticoagulation if surgery allows. So you can have STT changes because of the rapid tachycardia. So for that, you can, you have to treat the SVT in these patients and coagulation modulation if surgery permits in these patients. So use of heparin intraoperatively for myocardial ischemia because it is a pathologic thrombosis and if you need to reverse the ischemia and prevent further myocardial infarction or muscle damage by inhibiting the thrombosis formation. Therefore, heparin is very vital even if it is an intraoperative uh, heparin, if it, is, if it has to be given. So some severe resistant intraoperative myocardial ischemia may occur in some patients. So these are the patients in whom you have to, you may have to abort the surgery and then go for an IABP 
or immediately rush the, rush the patient to the cardiac surgery. Patients who are, who are receiving chemotherapy might develop STT changes intraoperative, especially those who have adriamycin-based chemotherapy or those who have developed cardiomyopathy, those who are having uh, too much of insult or surgical insult, uh, post cardiothoracic surgery, you may have STT changes, or if the patient has developed stunned myocardium. So what is a stunned myocardium? It is an ischemia with dysfunction followed by reperfusion before the death of myocardial cells. So the before MI can proper myocardial death can occur, these are the, the myocardium becomes stunned, but there will be reperfusion in these patients. A hibernate or a hibernate myocardium where there is ischemia following a chronic low flow state. So, what are the post operative considerations? Take care of the pain. You may you have to continue with your epidural, you may give IV pain uh, drugs, or you may continue with the blocks, or you can use a PCA pump. You can do whatever, but take care of the pain to avoid myocardial ischemia. So, in conclusion, a thorough investigation and optimization if there is a history of coronary artery disease and these factors have to be done. Peripheral nerve blocks and epidural anesthesia provide the least insult. GA, if you're thinking, high opioid anesthesia will, give you, will have least hemodynamic alterations. And whatever anesthesia you give, keep your demand supply economics in mind before giving anesthesia. Thank you very much. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Very much uh, knowledgeable thoughts you shared with us. And uh, uh, since Nair, we never meet. Uh, this one is a good session. So I just kept uh, some of your private uh, practice in yes, mind. Yes, yes. So that's yes, why sir. I went in depth in... Uh, coronary stents and, you know, and also intraoperative STT. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Tejas, you want to ask anything? Uh, madam, uh, the considerations for antiplatelet are very much varying. Actually, the cardiologist out here, many times they tell clopidab to be continued. No. And also some day, some say about three days, just three days for, before clopidogrel, surgery. right? If it is an emergency, see, I tell you what, clopidogrel, if it is a peripheral surgery, even I would say three days, you know, you can take the risk. But I'm telling you, it's a risk. Okay. On paper, if, if you go by guidelines, risk. seven days. There's no compromise on that. If you go by guidelines. But since you're a private practitioner, and private practitioners don't go by textbook all the time. I know that. So, in the, such a case, if it is a peripheral surgery, then three days of stopping, I would say, I would still, you know, say, okay, take a risk, but not otherwise. What about my uh, spinal and uh, any neuraxial blockhead? Three days is okay. No, no. Peripheral nerve blockade, which are if you don't have a deep plexus blockade, okay, or mm. if there is no facial block, like if you are not going for, uh, say, tap block, or if you're not mm. going for uh, erector spinae block, but you're just doing a peripheral nerve block, like, say, hernia block, or, you know, simple peripheral block, right? Then, mm. then I won't bother so much. But uh, no, not otherwise. Three days is also not sufficient for clopidab? No, no, no. no. If you're doing ultrasound guided and not hitting any vessel. Uh, no, for the neuraxial basically. No, Spinal you're going blind, blind, right? You want to do blind. Blind, blind. No, blind. no, no. Because uh, cardiologists, they say to stop only for three days. Then uh, we have taken the cardiologist's opinion and they, they themselves say that they will stop for only three days. Then uh, the surgeon will be saying, the cardiologist is saying so and so, whatever guideline it is that they have to manage. Many times we delay it, but sometimes we have to do in that scenario. See, your the, the topic here is major non-cardiac surgery. 
Yeah. Major non-cardiac surgery means patient can have fluid shifts. Okay. If you are under great, you should not succumb to pressure. It is seven days. Seven days. Ask him to show the guideline for three days. Ask him to show. Okay. If the guideline says three days, you say, okay. This is major cardiac, major non-cardiac surgery. No. So you should not, you should not err on that. But what I am just trying to tell you is there is something called, uh, you know, intermediate risk surgery, which I already mentioned, and low risk surgery, which I already mentioned. In that, if there are any peripheral surgeries, breast surgery, okay, limb surgery, all these you, you can take some amount of risk of three days, I can understand. But if it is a major, please keep platelets also ready if you have taken the patient for, yeah. uh, for uh, within three days. Keep platelets ready with you. Uh, you mentioned about platelet function test, but uh, I don't think in the, no, the periphery like that. Not many people are possible, doing, but the guidelines are saying you have to test. monitor PFA. PFA is very difficult to, yeah, you uh, have to, to bother ask. If you have to do it, the PFA. No, so. no, it's not possible. I, it's just that I'm, I'm just giving you the guidelines. Okay. But even in uh, tertiary hospitals, we are not doing that. So that's not possible all the time. Uh, okay. um, uh, sometimes the best you can do is, you know, keep a, take a blood and look at the clotting time. Okay. That's uh, BTCT type. Yeah, that's it. Uh, sometimes, ma'am, uh, in the uh, age, uh, old age patient geriatrics, the diastolic systolic will be a there is a wide pulse pressure, mm -hmm. like 60, 70. Suppose it's a baseline pressure of 140, 70, without any aortic wall issues or anything, mm -hmm. just wide pulse pressure. So, uh, you said about diastolic pressure to be maintained. In such cases, if there is a, if you give spinal anesthesia, the systolic will be will maintaining it around 120, but diastolic will fall around 50, 60. It will fall 10 points, suppose. Then uh, this diastolic should be considered according to the baseline, right? Yes. Okay. Yes. Remember, but uh, you have to ensure that, uh, you know, BP doesn't fall in these patients. Yeah. Give phenylephrine. That will, that will buck up the diastolic pressure. Naturally. That Thank is you. something which you have to be very careful uh, in uh, ischemic heart disease. Don't allow hypotension. Hypotension, yes. Sir. Yeah. Don't allow hypotension. You should target you the very, very, You have to be very proactive when it comes to hypotension. Immediately you have to treat. Definitely. You should target the mean pressure, right? See, mean pressure is only going to tell you about the uh, flow, flow in various organs. But coronary flow is dependent on LVED. Remember LVED. Okay. Here we are looking at coronary flow. Okay. So, takeaway home message was... For peripheral procedures, you cannot uh, mean to say not to worry about that three days clopidogrel dose given by cardiology. But for major surgeries, you should be worrisome. Yes. With platelets. Yes. Yeah. No, madam also said for uh, spinal epidural also you should uh, stop for seven days at least. Yes. 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 But yes, for uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Central neuraxial yeah. blockade and facial blocks, you have to stop. Or deeper, nice deeper nose. And also because yeah, yeah. you all are not using ultrasound. Yes, yes, ma'am. Nicer yes. guidelines also say the same thing. Yes. Uh, the is, okay. Yes. So, so overall, there will be seven days uh, stoppage of clopidogrel. But for uh, private forum point of view, you can do for smaller cases or for that. Three days is sufficient, something for peripheral. Yeah. Not to give deeper no blocks for that. Yeah. Yeah. Not for prostate, yeah. not for ophthal, not for neuro, and not for spine. Remember that. Not at Me, all. Yes, yes. Me, to I have seen many patients, ma'am, with uh, having prostate issues, 
the TURP done, uh, taken from plot evacuation uh. after for 12 hours. That's then we all. see the file. Uh, yeah, aspirin was continued hmm. and clopidem was uh, stopped just two days back. And That's what I'm trying to tell you. Aspirin same thing. continue. See, aspirin, the, the thing is, don't stop aspirin. If it's and a prophylactic dose given. But clopidogrel, you have to stop. I know. If the aspirin is given just as a prophylaxis. They, 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 they get uh, 75 milligram or 125 milligram. That's not much. 75. Yeah, they, they don't get much of aspirin, but they get <laughs> Pardon? Depend, uh, depend any sound? <laughs> <you do? laughs> depend? I think uh, you have to mute a few people. Yeah, yeah, I think so. I think so. Uh, from, uh, Hello? Yes, yes, Dipin. Uh, can you oh. unmute yourself? Yeah, mute yes, yourself, yes. please. Yeah. Yes. Please, Tejas, can you continue? Tejas? Okay, ma'am. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. what, what are you asking on that uh, point? The same or... thing, the same uh, scenario, the TRB patient and all. What yes, yes, yes. yes, yes, yes. So, I think uh, in question and answer box one, Dr. Priyanka Jadav mentioning about my amazing lecture, ma'am. It's uh... so I feel the from audience. Uh, any questions can you please uh, want to ask? Uh, you can ask in the Q&A box or any suggestions for that. Or queries you can ask in Q&A box for madam. OK, OK. Uh, we'll unmute you. Uh, Deepen, uh, can you unmute Dr. Someshwar Patangi, sir, please? It will be. Yes, yes. Yeah. Or even you can keep him panelists also, no issues. Sir, will be, sir is our president elect from ISC to Sir, you are There is a question by Tarin um, Mittel. Yes, yes, ma'am. Yeah, I yeah, don't have phenylephrine, only termin. Use whatever you have. Yeah. You you can use uh, ephedrine. You can use the whatever whatever you have. But you have to bring the BP up. That's important. But if you have phenylephrine, nothing like it because it's a pure alpha. You know. Yes, yes. Uh, yes. No, it's it is easily available by neon or fenpress. Yeah, less uh, it's easily available. From uh, Varsha, Varsha, Varsha Vora, yeah. stoppage for five days for spinal for ortho surgery. Is it okay? <laughs> See, uh, I would say stop seven days because that's the guideline. Again, uh, uh, for spinal, if you're using See, I, I, this is this. I'm talking to you as a teacher uh, from a medical college. I would say no, seven days. But in private practice, five days. If I have to give a spinal, I will use a very thin needle. Got it? Spinal, but I would not advocate. I'm not going to advocate this, but. I'm sure you people don't follow me, uh, you know, textbook, as I said. So if you have to use it, then use a very thin spinal needle. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Uh, please, Patangi, sir, you have unmuted, I think so. Depend. 
you unmute dr someshwar patange patange sir yes, welcome yes. nice to see you sir you have to unmute yourself yeah yeah okay are you getting me yes sir yeah yes yes to see you after long time madam yes sir nice nice to have you here yeah yeah actually one question i have uh, i got a call that patient is uh, under hypotension is a uh, hypotension and they have started the sympathomimetic and when i reach the the bp was 140 and uh, 90 so can i give uh, dextromethate to that patient can i can i give dextromethate next med next med next med Dexmed. It was the patient yeah. having uh, tachycardia? Laparotomy. It's a lap laparotomy no, patient. No, was there tachycardia? Yeah, tachycardia and patient was um, on sympathomimetic. So actually, no, no. Which drug? Yeah. Which drug? You mean patient was on uh, inotropic support? Yeah, yeah, inotropic support. Dopamine. Yeah, dobutamine. Dobutamine. Okay. Yeah. All so right. So should I go for the dexmed? See, dexmedetomidin generally it decreases the heart rate, but it has got very little effect on blood pressure. But is your is was is the heart rate also very high when you are giving? Yes, yes, yes. That's why I am telling. Then you have to what? give because you have to bring down the heart rate also. Okay, but just half an hour back, the patient was under hypertension. I know, but now the patient is on dobutamine. now yeah. the blood pressure is fine but there is tachycardia yeah so you have to give okay, okay. Uh, we can give esmolol also rana yeah but dexmed is you know it also provides analgesia and yeah 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 you know and it it has got very little effect on uh, blood pressure and it it decreases the requirement got, na? in fact you know if you compare it with esmolol esmolol's effect on blood pressure is much you know More hypotension as compared to, uh, as compared to dexmedetomidin. So I would okay. any day go for dexmedetomidin. Yeah, actually, it decreases the requirement of opiate also. Yes. Yeah. So better to I go. I would go it. for it. I would go. Yeah. For it. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Mal. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Sir is our president elect, uh, and. Uh, Really, thank you, ma'am. Really nice. For your yes, yes. Yeah. We are missing you on, uh, on CME Borivili. I, I tried to oh, see yeah. that you Actually, you didn't see on that day. I had been to Tirupati. Yeah. I had been to Tirupati at that time. Okay. So, so uh, you know, the tickets were booked long before. So I just couldn't do anything about it because in Tirupati you have to do online booking. Yes, yes, ma'am. Nowadays and then, all that. Yeah. So yes. there was no question of cancelling anything. So I had to go there. Yeah, huge queue for darshan also. So you, it was a surprise, and it's our fortunate that we should go on that time. Uh, uh, overall, uh, uh, yes, sir. If you have any question, you can ask, or otherwise you can unmute yourself. Mute yourself. Uh, even Dr. Zinat uh, Patwegar uh, has uh, mentioning that excellent talk by ma'am. I think no questions in Q and A box if if any. They just you want to ask any other question for madam? No sir. Okay. Yes. Uh, Tejas is a uh, ma'am. He is a first cardiac anesthetist from our uh, ISA Nanded City branch. He done uh, almost hundred plus cardiac cases in uh, uh, bypass surgeries and all. So very, very nice. talented person and uh, oh. <laughs> really. Keep <laughs> yeah, it yeah. up. God bless. Yeah. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, this time we oh, we are doing uh, nice work from IS in Nanded, and he one of the person is uh, doing. We all are doing of, excellent job. Yes, 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 ma'am. Excellent. Yes. So we we are keeping this case meets on the behalf of our celebration year, that's uh -huh. Platinum Jubilee celebration year. With that, our ISA 
and nandeed city branch is on uh, 25th year so platinum with silver jubilee year wow. so that both things are happening this year so and i am secretary and you have a time. dynamic secretary and president no 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 nothing so, not, not like that man yeah of course uh, i'm so stalwart. proud of you i am so proud of you thank you man thank you thank you you all are doing an excellent job no doubt about yes. it yes we are keeping pg con in uh, jan or feb man Uh, so we'll talk on that next time when uh, whenever the time permits uh, earliest from my, my side and or i said under city branch point of view okay. so i feel uh, yes so you all are doing it through isa or what is it isa yes yes yeah yeah, yeah. through ISA? isa uh, it's it's a state uh, right. activity yeah, yeah. they they awarded that pg con and yeah. even we are planning for building national cme hope so we will get in uh, 25th 27th sri long Yeah. all the best yes yes uh thank you ma'am i will conclude this session uh, very much uh, thank you from our iccd branch members and dr pralad uh, kotkar sir and uh, myself sachin uh, president secretary uh, we really really thank you to on uh, coming on of this platform of our isa case meets iccd branch thank you ma'am thank you. yes thank you thank you so i will conclude this session we'll send you recording of this session earliest thank you